My name is Alan Floyd, and it is my privilege to be the lead pastor here at Cottage Hill. And we come this morning to honor and to celebrate the life of Kelsey Nobles. Kelsey was a 2018 graduate of Baker High School, member of the National Honor Society Key Club, avid Auburn fan. Enjoyed spending time with her family and friends. She is survived by her father and stepmother, Dino and Tiffany Nobles, her mother, Lisa. She's also survived by her younger sister, London, and older brother, Alec. Her grandparents, many friends and family members that she loved dearly. Her lo loyal and dedicated dogs, Molly, Isabella, and Josie will miss her certainly as well. I want to welcome you on behalf of the family as we seek today to honor Kelsey's life, to celebrate her life. It's been my joy to have been her pastor. And before she joined the Navy, right up here in the balcony, she sat every week very faithfully with her Bible I asked if I could read from her Bible, and it is uh, filled with uh, notes and post-it notes, and I wanted to, uh, in the saddest of all occasions, I've discovered in my life and ministry that we need comfort that comes from God's Word. She had many notes, many verses highlighted, and uh, yesterday afternoon I was just reading through her Bible. It was very fascinating to me that in all of the book of Psalms, and generally where I go is to the Psalms for words of comfort. In all of the Psalms, she just had two verses highlighted. It was almost as if Kelsey was saying to us, here's, here's the word that I have for you. The first verse that she had highlighted is in Psalm 55 and verse 22, and it says, Cast your burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain you. And then on the very next page, the other verse that she had highlighted is Psalm 62 and verse 5. And it says, Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. I think Kelsey left a message for us that in these, the hardest and the most difficult of occasions in which we say goodbye to someone that we dearly love, it's hard, it's difficult. And the word from scripture says, cast your care, cast your burden on the Lord. He will sustain you, he will be your refuge. And so as we begin this time of celebrating her life, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, there are times in which it is hard, it's difficult for us to pray. Because we have questions. And there are times of tragedy that we, um, we want to know why. And our hearts are broken, our hearts are hurting. But Lord, as we have read from Kelsey's Bible, Lord, the reminder that in the darkest of occasions, we are to call out to you, that you can be the refuge and that you can hold us up. You can sustain us in the darkest of hours. And Lord, I pray right now that you would wrap your arms around this family and that you would hold them up and that you would whisper in their ear words of grace and words of mercy and words of comfort. God, we gather in this place this morning to say thank you for the 18 years that we had with Kelsey and the influence and the impact that she had in just a few short years. So Lord, be with us. Strengthen us. Be our refuge today. In Christ's name, amen. I want to introduce Navy Chaplain Rick Tiff to come and share a few words.
Good morning and thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for traveling all this way. Thank you, honored guests. And uh, most of all, I'd like to thank the family as a Navy chaplain for your support for Kelsey, for her service to her country. We are thankful to Kelsey for what she, for what she did for our country and for making that difficult decision to, to, to make that, that kind of decision, that very brave decision to serve her country. And we know that during this difficult time, this is, it, it's hard to process all of it. But, but we are most of all thank you, thankful, we're thankful for your support and for your help. During this time, I, I often think about Jesus' last words he said to his disciples, which is mentioned in, in, in John 10. And in, in, in John 10, he, he, he says these words to his disciples right before he is going to go to the cross, right before he is going to go and, 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 and be crucified, but to eventually resurrect from the dead. And what he says is he says in, in John chapter 10, verse 11, says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own, and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep who do not belong to this fold. I must bring them, and they will listen to me and listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. And the thing that, that really resonates for me in this is, is Jesus is talking to his, type, to his disciples right before a time that he knows is going to be very difficult, a time that is going to be very dark and very challenging. And Jesus knows that, that his disciples are going to, to struggle with, with his death and with his resurrection, and they're going to be confused. And even, even Peter himself denied Jesus three times. But Jesus said to them, he said, I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I will be with you through those darkest of times. And even when you deny me three times, Peter, I will forgive you and I will love you and I will embrace you in the midst of that. And I believe that's what, that's what Jesus is saying to us today is he's saying, I am the good shepherd. I will not forsake you. I will stay with you during this time, though it's confusing and though it's hard. I am with you. But I also think of Kelsey, that she was, in a sense, a good shepherd as well. That she decided to, to serve her country. She decided to make that difficult and, and, and courageous choice. Not to just stand by like the hired hand and to watch things happen, but she decided to make a decision to serve her country and to do something great. And though this is not the situation we, we want to see, we can look to her example and look to Jesus' example as someone who cares for their own. We are called to be God's incarnational presence in the world through, through our life in Christ. And Kelsey, for us, showed us that example. And so does Jesus in his own life. So as we look to Kelsey and, and we honor her life and we celebrate her life, let us remember that we are called to be Jesus in the world. We're called to be the people that make those types of brave choices, just as Jesus did. Please join me in the word of prayer. We thank you so much, God, for the life of Kelsey. And we thank you so much for what she did and, and the life that she lived and for her, her faithful service to you and to her country. We ask, Lord, that we would be inspired by, by her example, that we would become the incarnational presence in this world, that we, would, that we would make an impact in the world just as she has and just as we are called to. We ask, Lord, that you would be with us and empower us during this difficult time. Be with us. Be with those who mourn and comfort us and let us allow you to be the good shepherd in our lives. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 
At this time, Kelsey's father has asked to come and share just a few words of encouragement and memory regarding Kelsey. First, I would like to thank everybody for coming out and uh, honoring my daughter. Uh, I guess as I sat there, I started thinking to myself that, uh, and I think I'm saying it right, that the young die and the old linger. And I feel that way right now. I feel like my daughter was very young and was taken from me, but I know she's in a better place. I'm going to try to... Uh, read to you something that I wrote without uh, stuttering or crying and try to be as clear as possible. All I've ever wanted was to be a father. I did not think Kelsey would ever come to be. I can remember praying, trying to bargain with God, asking that if he would just bless me with a daughter, that I promise that I would love and protect her to my dying breath, that I would never lie or sin again in my entire life that I would do everything right from here on. But there is no bargaining with the Lord. His will shall be done. No amount of money or promises you can make will change that. When I received the call telling me that my daughter had passed away, I began again trying to bargain with the Lord, asking that if he would just let them call me back, saying that it was a mistake, that she was still alive. I promise I would never lie or sin again, that I would do everything right from here on. As I laid in the yard this past Saturday, staring into the sky, not thinking of anything, just feeling numb to the world around me, I believed I received my answer. There was no miracles performed. The sun did not shine down onto my face. The earth did not shake. There were no white doves flying over my head. Only a clear and present thought to me, saying, Dino, I have blessed you with Kelsey for 18 years, and it is time for her to come home. Mm. That was all. That was all that was said, and it was enough. I believe I will see my daughter again, either when the father calls me home or when he returns. I have seen my daughter mature in so many ways this past year, but mostly how she evolved in her faith. I can remember looking at her as Pastor Allen spoke one Sunday. I watched her smile with excitement as he spoke. Afterwards, while riding to Cracker Barrel, as we usually do, she was so excited to tell us about the sermon, how Pastor touched her, and she understood what he was saying. That day, whatever he said sparked the true interest of faith in my daughter. She began reading and studying the Bible with her stepmother. Many nights she would come into our room and sit in the recliner and just talk and ask questions about something she read or were curious about. I am thankful for that day when Pastor Allen ignited a flame inside my daughter. As a father, I tried to instill four simple but crucial values into my daughter. I hope in some way that she touched some of you with at least one of them. First and foremost, to put God first in everything she did, to never waver in her faith. If she were to keep God first, all other things would fall into place. Secondly, to always treat people better than they her, because you never know what may be going on in that person's life. Your one smile or kind word could change their whole day. Ugly will only get you ugly in return but kindness may not be returned to you by that person, but it will be repaid to yourself by the joy you have inside. Third, family members are not only made by blood, but by those that love and respect you. Seven years ago, Kelsey was blessed abundantly with family. She gained a loving stepmother, a big brother, four grandparents, and a multitude of uncles, aunts, cousins, and a niece not to forget all the new friends she made along the way. Lastly, I used to repeat this phrase the most, so much so that Kelsey repeated it back to me at times. 
Always be the one asking, what about you? Not asking, what about me? This was a phrase that I had to explain to her and she did not understand at first, but it became her favorite of all lessons I tried to teach her. The meaning is to always take chances in life, never, the what, never wonder the what ifs, stand up for those that cannot stand on their own, to do the right thing even when no one else is watching, stand strong in your faith. And when you do this, you can turn to the person next to you and ask them, what about you? Are you going to do the right thing like she did? Always be the one asking what about you, not asking what about me. If my daughter has touched at least one person here today in her life with one of these lessons, then I have succeeded in my job as a father. There's a note that my daughter left on our bathroom mirror before she left for boot camp. It reads, I love you, Dad. I will always be with you in my heart. Love, Tofu. That is a name I called her, Tofu, my special baby. I used to always tell her that no matter how old she got, that she would still be my baby, my little Tofu. That letter will remain on my mirror so that each morning I will be reminded to start my day with a smile and every night I will rest knowing her love. I pray that when you think of my daughter, that you will not only shed tears of sadness, but also ones of joy, that she lived a fruitful life, and now she is with the Father, our Lord and Savior. Thank you. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life You have been so, so kind to me And oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God And oh, it chases me down, I still unfound Leaves the ninety-nine, and I couldn't earn
Kelsey, love to hear Malachi lead us in worship on Sundays, and Reckless Love was one of her favorite songs. In fact, when she was in the car with the family, when that song came on, she made everybody be quiet and she would turn it up. An incredible, incredible young lady. For the last couple of weeks, I have been listening to friends and family members talk about Kelsey overhearing some conversations and seeing comments on social media about Kelsey, those that she graduated with, those that knew her and loved her. And it seemed like with, with regard to her friends and her family, those that knew Kelsey best, there were some key words that kept coming up again and again, just a common theme in describing Kelsey. I want to share two or three of those words as we celebrate her life today. One of the words that we kept hearing over and over again is the word in describing Kelsey, the word determination. A very determined young lady. You could also call it persistence. At times, you might would actually use the phrase hard-headed. Kelsey was a very determined. She would set her mind on something, and if she set her mind on it, it was going to happen. She was going to do it. For example, she had determined in her mind that what God had for her was to be a pediatrician. And so she had made the decision that really the best way for her is to join the Navy and become the best uh, person that she can be in the Navy and then ultimately through the Navy go to school and pursue her dreams. In her joining the Navy, she studied, she exercised, she prepared hours and hours and hours so that she would be ready and that she could do the best that she could do. She was, because she was determined and that was her personality, it kind of caused her or helped her and she was a very organized person. As I've just kind of looked through her Bible and uh, some of the notes that she had taken and to understand how she lived her life, she was very organized. And because she was determined, because there was this element of persistence about her, Kelsey at times was very fearless. She would charge in. She would do it. It didn't matter because her mind was made up and that's what she was going to do. Not only was she determined, and you've already heard from her father, but she was selfless. 
She did think of others. You did a good job, mom and dad, to encourage her to be selfless. The story is told about uh, her grandmother gave her $10 to go in the store and buy some candy. And she came out and she didn't just buy herself some candy, but she bought everybody else in the car some candy. It wasn't just about her, but it was about other people. Even at times if she was out at a restaurant, she would make sure that she leave a very big tip. She was selfless. She thought about others. She was an encourager. And kind of listening to some family members and friends, and really in just seeing here in her note, there's probably about 30 post-it notes here in this Bible with little notes in it. I asked uh, some of her family members about that and said, oh yeah, she was the queen of the post-it notes. Uh, she left her dad some notes with post-it notes. She left her sister. She lost left family members uh, these post-it notes. Even in the Navy, other recruits have talked about the fact that she would get up early in the morning, sometimes 3 o'clock in the morning in the Navy, and leave these other recruits post-it notes to encourage them. All of the post-it notes were notes of encouragement. It may have a verse, it may have some affirmation, but even her sister, she left her sister many, many, like about 50 post-it notes on for her sister to encourage her. Yesterday in our teaching time, we looked at the book of Hebrews. There's a particular passage that talks about encourage one another daily as it is still called today. I love the fact that even as a young lady of 18 years old, use the opportunities to encourage to encourage family members and friends and fellow recruits and really anyone and any, everyone that she encountered, she wanted to encourage them. And then the third word or the third phrase that I kept hearing again and again is her strong faith. You heard from her father that a while back she sat there in that balcony and she bowed her head and she renewed, she committed her life to God. And she began this, this journey with her determination to grow her faith, to become stronger in her faith. And was again reading through her Bible and there's these notes and these comments and these things a part of her journey. She sought God and God revealed himself to her. She could see the hand of God almost daily. She would constantly text her family and say, I saw this on Instagram, I saw this on a bumper sticker, I saw this on a car, I saw this, and I felt like God was speaking to me through this, and here's what God is saying. So almost every day as she is seeking God, God is revealing himself more and more to her. She saw the hand of God. She heard from God. She had a strong faith. We knew her, you knew her. Many of you family members, you saw her all of her life, all 18 years, you knew her very, very well, far better than I knew her. But it's interesting that her fellow recruits, as they would describe her, one of the other recruits made this statement. In the weeks that we had together, I would describe Kelsey in three words. And this is the three words that this other recruit, the words that she used to describe Kelsey. The first word is the word Southern. She was Southern. She was Southern. She was determined. And she had a strong faith. So think about this encounter for just a relatively brief period of time and you walk away and you say about this person, she's Southern, but she was determined and she had a strong faith. What do we do now? What do we do to honor her? What do we do 
to celebrate her memory. What do we do from here? I think we seek to be encouragers. I think that we learn from Kelsey. I think that we use her as a model in many ways and say what we will take from her 18 years is that we will seek every day to smile and say, but what about you? And maybe go to the store and buy a pack of 100 post-it notes and leave people notes of encouragement. And then I would say, pursue God. Seek to have a strong faith. Because ultimately, if you want to see Kelsey again, then you need to know her God and her Savior. The Bible says this. The Bible says that we are not to grieve as the rest of this world that has no hope. So we hurt today. We grieve today. We have questions today. But ultimately, we know. We will see Kelsey again. I began to think, to be honest with you, when I received word of Kelsey's tragic passing, I even shared with some of her family members that I began to question as a pastor, why? God brought me to a story. I'm going to share a story from the Word of God very briefly, and then we'll leave from this place. There's a story in Mark chapter 4 in which Jesus and the crowds have been pursuing Jesus and the disciples, and he's teaching, he's doing the miraculous, but it's almost as if he can't get away from the crowd. So ultimately, he says to his disciples, hey, let's get on the boat, and let's go out into the Sea of Galilee, and let's just kind of rest and relax and get away from the crowd. So Jesus gets on the boat with the disciples, and they cast off, and they go out into the sea with the hopes of resting and relaxing. No agenda, no plan, just to get away. And if you understand the Sea of Galilee and and the Mediterranean Sea and the winds coming from Mount Hermon, and there's a, often it was not uncommon, even today at the Sea of Galilee, it is not uncommon for suddenly storms, very, very violent storms to erupt very quickly. It's almost in some ways here in the south where in the middle of the summer, it's a beautiful day, and then within 30 minutes, there's this horrific thunderstorm. So Jesus is asleep on the boat. There is this violent storm. In the boat are fishermen, professional fishermen, who are fearful for their life. They really believe they're going to die. Let me read the account. On that day when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across to the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat so that the boat was already filling up with water, but he was in the stern of the boat asleep on the cushion. So they woke him, and they said to him, Teacher, do you not care that we are dying? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind, and he said to the sea, Be still, peace, and the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And then he said to them, why are you so afraid? Where is your faith? And they were filled with great fear, and they said to one another, who is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? And so I want to say to you, family members and friends, There are some lessons for us today when we have these questions, and I think one of the lessons that we can learn is that there is no guarantee against the sudden. You can be going about your life, and everything is fine, and everything is good, and the phone rings, and you receive the most tragic and the most difficulty of news. There is no guarantee against the sudden. The Lord Jesus was actually in the boat But it was no guarantee against the sudden, and in this case, a violent storm. Even for the Christ follower, suddenly our worlds can be turned upside down. In fact, we actually read in Scripture, we read about Job, we read about the Apostle Paul, we read about the other disciples. We read, just because you are a believer in God does not exempt you from the sudden. There's another lesson, and it's this. It may appear 
that God isn't doing anything. The disciples in the boat thought they were dying. And it appeared to them that the Lord was not doing anything. And I know that in these days, when we wrestle with the whys and the question, we can, we can, God, where are you? God, what are you doing? Are you doing anything? These experienced fishermen were scared for their lives and Jesus was sleeping through it. And I confess to you that when I received word that Kelsey had died and what had happened, I said to the Lord, Lord, where are you? Are you asleep? And one of the things that we have to be very careful of that we learn from this particular passage is that if we're not very careful, that fear can replace faith. The disciples, even though they were with the Lord himself, the Bible says they were filled with fear. In fact, when they woke him up, the first thing that he said was, why are you afraid? It is in these times when we have so many questions and sometimes doubts that we begin to allow fear replace our faith. Do you still have no faith? So what Jesus does is he challenges us to look deep within and to remember so that in our pain and in our grief and in our questions, we can begin to turn toward him in faith and he can begin bringing healing. A couple more truths. One is that Jesus hears our cries. It seems that Jesus didn't hear the storm. He's sound asleep. He didn't hear the storm, but he did hear their cries. I said to the family, I've said to some friends, I don't have all the answers, but I know that Jesus hears our cries. And I know that the Lord is in control. The disciples were overwhelmed, but they saw Jesus take control. And ultimately, I need you to know that he is in control and that we have to trust him. The church, I believe, is to be an expression of his love and his compassion. I think I would leave you with one more word. It's a very interesting, that I don't know if I've ever noticed before in this story. But it says early on, I think it's in verse number 36, it says, it says early on that there were other boats with them. So here's what that means. That means that when these disciples in the boat, that they thought they were going to die, and then Jesus calmed the storm and then calmed them, that there were other boats and other people that were affected by his calming of the storm. So what I would say to you today is that in the coming days, there are other people who are watching. There are other people who are watching. And as God calms you, as God works in your life and helps to bring about some healing, other people will be helped because you will be able to say, I know that pain. I know what that feels like. And I know that God is good and that God can bring healing. There will be other people helped, other people affected. And so what we simply pray today is, Lord, help us to trust you and help us to learn from Kelsey. Let's leave today determined to be encouragers and determined to grow in our faith. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, all that human hands can do has been done. And where we leave off, you take up and you take care. So we pray that you go with us as we make our way to this cemetery. And we will commit this body to the earth and commend this spirit, this soul to be with you. And Lord, we look forward to the day. We long for the day that we will see Kelsey again. We look forward to that great reunion. And God, in the meantime, 
Help us to be encouragers, as Kelsey was such a great encourager. Help us to think of others, even before ourselves, and to pursue you so that you reveal yourself to us and you strengthen our faith and our trust in you. And God, what I pray for this family is that you would bring healing as they look to you. Go with us in your grace and in your mercy. In Christ's name, amen.